answer that nobody could answer answer for me when I was a kid. What is Tron? The name came from, and Steven Lisberger mentioned in the documentary. It's short for Electron Man. Hmm. So that's what the name came around because I was like, "What is this? Like, a, it's a bizarre name, but it comes from." He made a short video. They use it for promotion for radio for TV, and it's a it's just a guy with all light, and he raises his hand with a disc because it's radio, mm. and it says Electron Man, but he sold it to radio stations for commercial, mm. and that's the name came from. It's just short for Electron Man. Hmm. I didn't have a clue about that. <laughs> Nobody asked because I asked, "What's his name Tron mean?" You know, hmm. Just Tron. Shut up. Enjoy it. Yeah. There's a lot of questions I have about the world of Tron. Ones that maybe aren't always delved into. So we're going to yeah. try and peel back the layers, get into the circuitry, and talk about uh, a 1982 the, film today. The frontier of CGI live-action movies. Yeah, Tron. Join us. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thanks again for watching. Thanks again for finding us, and for our loyal fans, thank you for continued support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals that tell us what to do. Uh, today we're going to talk about a classic from 1982 again. It's 40 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. If there's a movie that I was obsessed with while well, waiting for the third Star Wars movie and the next Indiana Jones movie, it was this movie. So it's a little bit like Star Wars, isn't it? It's, it's own Star Wars. It's, it's a little the bit Star, like... the Disney Star Wars before they own Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's talk Tron. When computer hacker and game developer Kevin Flynn sneaks into his former workplace to prove that his work was stolen from him, he is captured and transported into the digital world where he must team up with a security program named Tron and stop the ever-expanding master control program in order to escape. So a lot of the movies from 1982 had to compete for special effects and really could stand out because at the time you had E.T. come out that's great special effects. You had Poltergeist, the still Steven Spielberg movies, oh, yeah. great special effects. Blade Runner, you also have what, you know, The Thing, the thing. and Star Trek II, uh, Wrath of Oh Con. yeah, Wrath so of Con. Con. You had great <laughs> movies in 1982 that had a lot of special effects that weren't Star Wars or Indiana Jones at the time, but here, then you bleep this, and then people are like, what is this? Because it's all special effects. Oh, yeah. Not to mention, uh, the film was disqualified from the Oscar running because yeah. using computers was considered cheating in visual effects. <laughs> right. So and this is almost like practical effects We need to disqualify every movie ever made since the early 2000s because none of them have avoided using computers in the same way. Yeah, and actually, what's funny is most of this movie was done without computers. A lot of it was done with hand painting I was going to say, it's like, well, it's like practical computer effects. Yeah. And you actually had to spend a year just doing hand painting. So it's yeah. kind of something where it's so ahead of its time that it's considered cheating for it. Um, yeah, his name is Danny Shore. He plays Ram, which is I think we know it's a computer mm -hmm. term now that kids like to enjoy. His name is Ram, mm -hmm. but uh, he said when he was on this walking down the set for audition between auditions on Hollywood Boulevard that somebody went to him. He goes, "You're Danny Shore, right? Yeah, I had to paint your nose for a year, and I hate your nose." <laughs> <laughs> but what they did, how they did it back then was you had to do in a studio all black, mm -hmm. everything was black, and they had to wear all white. And so Jeff Bridges said, "We'll spend like." 10 hours a day on set, black and white, black and white, everything was black and white, and then you go outside and color, and we get a headache from going outside, because it's all boom, then your, your brain gets adjusted to the environment. Well, and it's ironic that you, we, we talked to previously about the last picture show, but we get another black and white shot, Jeff Bridges. This one's just drastically different after editing. Yeah, <laughs> but differently, yes. But this movie doesn't get made without Jeff Bridges being on board right away. Mm -hmm. he, uh, Steven Lisberger contacted him, and Jeff Bridges said, yes, I'll absolutely do this. So I don't think the first step to getting this made was Jeff Bridges saying yes, and he completely was all in the entire time. Mm. It's good to have you, because again, yeah. Jeff Bridges has always been a person who has Takes seemingly risks. taken risks on smaller filmmakers. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that was probably true early in his career too, because he's still fairly early in 82. This is a young Bridges who I would be surprised if he had, he doesn't have as much clout as he has today. Um, no. You know, but he still had a Still Lloyd Bridges' kid, up. right. He was still, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, son of Lloyd, brother of Bo, he was, you know, he was still a part of it. But it's funny to think that this movie was shot in black and white. Uh, the animators who worked for Disney refused to help many of them because they were concerned that this movie would put them out of a job one day. Um, and, it, you know, it's kind of true. They did close the 2D animation portion of Disney Animation, and it was actually reopened by Pixar's John Lasseter. Okay. So, in a way... The movie was did kill traditional animation, but then yeah, did. Um, did. 3D animation brought it back. So, so it's, 
I don't yeah. know. You have <laughs> even the, the um, Disney Studios hating the movie. They're financing it. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of people working inside of Disney Studios hating the movie. They're working on it. You have a lot of people outside that don't know what the heck's going on, and you're really the evolutionary step of pretty much corrupting the process. They feel like, um, and then you have these outsiders coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, one of the things that also also saved this movie is you have Harrison Ellenshaw, who was a famous matte painter for movies. So mm -hmm. he worked on matte painting for like Steel, Steven Spielberg movies. He also did a lot of for Star Wars, and he brought on board. So a lot of people who come down from Studio Disney saying shut this down, they would use him. No, we have Harrison Ellenshaw. This is going to be a legit, not all CGI on the you know, computer screen. We're using practical effects as well. That's another saving aspect, not to mention Jeff Bridges is still on board the entire process. Hmm. They probably had a cardboard cut out of him when he was gone. Right, yeah, 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 there he is, right, yeah. I used to convince people that I would, that I had a really tall brother because I had a cardboard cut out of Michael Jordan in my room. Uh, so <laughs> I yeah. get like, yeah, I get the idea of like using as many names as you can to keep your film alive. You do have to give a little bit of credit to Disney because they had to have been seeing these dailies and going, oh, we are in trouble. So they had Disney to have Studios, been seeing right. this, you know? Um, and I think to the point where they didn't put Disney on the opening title, I think it was a touchstone release. No, when I was on the sequel, somebody told me this Disney, Disney was everywhere. They yeah. sent it all over the place and said it's a Disney movie. Yeah. Um, this so is before Touchstone, and this is Disney Studio, which pretty much was an office in the corner. Yeah. And it's not was an accolade that we know nowadays. The, the funny thing, too, is that the, the scenes in the office with Bruce, Bruce ba Boxleitner's Alan Boxleitner. Bradley, that was the part of the office at Encom was the Disney Studio offices. <laughs> but then you can see the part at the edge where it's all matte painting. Because even they, they were envisioning a company that was even bigger than Disney at that point. You know? <laughs> and I think that's kind of funny that eventually, you know, we have Disney as the monolithic, you know, society building movie machine that it is today. Yeah. Um, it's funny, though, like, because when you think 1982, we got movies that just did not work for audiences. Blade Runner failed. This yeah. movie did okay, but it still was, a, I think it still it lost a money. Yeah, it was a shock. Um, it was a shock. The thing lost money. You know, this movie and Black Hole are the reason Disney stopped doing live action films for a decade. That's um, another movie Harrison worked on, yeah, Black you know? Hole too. Um, so what I think is another thing of the minus is because E.T. It's E.T. is almost the Disney movie that you thought Disney made. Yeah. And here they're going to kick out Tron as a counter. And Tron came out in the summer. Mm -hmm. And almost like the movie that we talked about, Black Hole, it was just kind of like put it out there, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see I think what they thought so they'd have a better chance competing. There was another movie that was coming out they thought they had a better chance of competing with that they moved it into. I think it was The Secret of Nim. Or something, and they like thought Piggy they had a chance it. with it because as it like counter programming. But then all other movies shifted around too, and they ended up competing against some of the big daddies. But <laughs> kids like us, I'm I'm 45 and a little bit older, who were obsessed with you know the Ataris, the video games. We got the concept. We knew about video game programming. We know about computers. And I think of people who a little bit older and didn't know that you could jump into a simulation, like a video game, like The Matrix. Ready Still didn't one. really grasp it. A lot of things. But my, my dad worked in computers. He was a hardware computer programmer. We all got the concept. And I think for a lot of people, they didn't. I think it's because the the film feels like it's about so much more. It feels so much more complex than it is. It's not yeah. a slight for me to say this, but I think this is a very simple movie. This is an Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, the remake. dialogue's a little chunky. Yeah, like yeah. he gets sucked in down the rabbit hole and ends up in Wonderland. It and literally he's got to get hole, back right? out, you know? It literally is a hole. Um, right? yeah. I think like people look into the movie and think it's so much more than it is. Um, it's a very, very simple story. Yeah. It's just there's a lot of technical jargon that people get concerned about. And it's kind of like when you talk about a movie like a Ready Player One or a Matrix, something like that. The movies. movie is actually those movies again feel like they're about so much more than they are. And it took us until the fourth Matrix movie for the director to literally say, No, the Matrix is a love story, not a not a sci fi movie. Like we get these like ideas where we try to think of these things as grander than they are. And you get and a little bit of a love triangle in this movie, a little bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Bruce Boxleiter, this is really fun. He, he was very famous for doing uh, kind of like ca character roles in westerns. So mm -hmm. when he got the call, he was going to do this sci-fi movie. He was on a horse, all dressed up in his western outfit. Like, you're going to do this movie, uh, Agent. Like, uh, what? <laughs> That's a kind of a little funny thing. Uh, Cindy Morgan from Caddyshack, she's joined in the uh, process. She, she admitted that she didn't really know what was going on at the time, but she knew that when they put the suit on, that she spent a lot of time in the gym after recognizing what she had to wear. So, and then the worldwide treasure, David Warner, in this movie. Yes. We all love David Warner. He plays the most wonderful villain. He, I think he enjoys playing the villain in this. It's interesting yeah. to note that, I mean, he is, 
David Warner is, I believe, in his late 70s or early 80s at this point. Yeah. He has been so much more well-known for the films he made in the last half of his career so far. You know, when you really look at it, movies from Tron onwards, that's what he got. He gets his clout from. People talk about his stuff in, you know, I guess The Omen was maybe the big one before this. Yeah. Um, but then he, of course, you know, right, Ninja Omen. Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze, he had that, like, he was a very involved character he was in, in Scream. that film. Scream 2. He was in Scream 2. Yeah. He, he had a great Tales from the Crypt episode. Like, this guy is so much larger than How the wonderful to be in Scream 2 when you're a fresh actor and you have David Warner, the accomplished Shakespeare and actor, yeah. come on stage and he's going to coach acting to you. And he was the villain in a Star Trek movie. But he's a great, I love that, I mean, Sark, and then he plays the, the guy on the real world, Dillinger, but he just mm-hmm. looks like just a menacing, this side of, I thought they were somehow related as a kid when I was five, like, this is guy somehow related to Darth Vader. Oh, no, he's, he's one of the Warner army, brothers. right, he's got this <laughs> emperor he has to answer to, which is the great He's got the kind of the back, you know, like yeah. sheath kind of thing too. Yeah. He also voices the master control program. That's an uncredited thing that he did. So yeah. he kind of Benedict Cumberbatch that thing, like he did with the Hobbit movies, where he just played like three different characters and we don't talk about them. So, <laughs> but it's great special effects of him when he gets angry and he almost lights up even more. Mm. Take them, he lights up a little bit. Uh, just yeah, the movie. Also, I with this movie when I was younger, I did exactly what I did with Raiders of the Lost Ark. You fast forward the talking points and you just go right into the action. How dare you? So I just like whether you like in the real world and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just get to the point where it gets sucked into the wormhole. We should also point out, too, like, I have this copy of of the Blu-ray of Tron. Um, This was not available. You could not get a physical media version of this movie or rent it before the sequel came out. Because that's when I'd gotten into it. I didn't, I had never seen Tron before, but Tron Legacy looked really cool. Those commercials looked really neat. And I wanted to see the movie. I had to drive to a friend's house who had an old, like, out of print, he had an out of print VHS of it. And he was like, "We'll watch it this way." And it was so fuzzy, but it was the only way I could see the movie. I know I have a, I have a, my recording was always from TV. They played it on TV probably like 1983, and we have the commercials included. So, so that shows so you that even when they were releasing Tron Legacy, they still had no faith in the original Tron. No, yeah, but it was fascinating because as a kid, we talked about these the movie with motorcycles. Yeah, video game motorcycles. We're like, let's play that video game. Where is Which it? Which yeah. we should also point out. The Tron video games did exist after the movie came out. Yes. And yes. they have, to this day, made more money for the company than <laughs> Tron did. The well, merchandise did. made more money for Star Wars than that. Yeah. yeah. So when you complain about uh, Disney Pixar making another Cars movie, even though they don't make that much money, merchandise and baby, that's what they Merch- learned from this movie is probably Spielberg. let's just merchandise, merchandise. the hell out of it. <laughs> um, this movie is edited by Jeff Gersel. He also did uh, uh, another Disney movie, uh, Flight of the Navigator, mm-hmm. and also did Outside Somewhere in Time. He's not really really well known, but I think this is probably his best editing choices because with special with the other character in this movie is sound. Music is mm-hmm. great. Yeah, the the sound music effects is, solid, is yeah. fantastic. I don't think you get if you don't have the sound effects, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they carried over the sound effects for the sequel. That's why I didn't like the sequel very much. They didn't re- really retain anything from the original. There wasn't the sound effects. It was a little the too below busy. the line elements are completely different. Yeah, yeah I mean the motorcycle is a little different. I know all about upgrading, but they didn't retain anything from the original movie, which I probably wanted a little bit more from the sequel. Mm. Um, obviously, we all know about the clue, which is from the beginning of the Tron, but it doesn't really establish that. Obviously, there was an animation movie that you had to watch before the sequel. So there was there was Tron Legacy, the sequel. There was also Tron Uprising, which was a limited or it was a series, a TV series. Yeah, and I think it ran for two seasons. Elijah Wood. Might have been in it, I think. You had to watch that to understand where Tron 2 was going. Because there was a lot of different time. And then, of course, there was also the short film The Next Day, which was about the disappearance of Kevin Flynn, but before the movie's events. Um, I don't think you needed to see it because I'd never seen it as well. And I will say this I prefer the sequel. I do. Um, I just, I think it's a little bit cleaner cut. I think the movie reaches a little bit more than this one does. Because one of the problems with being a movie that I assumed was going to be headier and was much more simplistic was I felt there was a lot of areas they could have expanded upon it. So that's why I actually prefer the sequel. But I do like elements of this film that I feel like it's nice that they are two completely different takes on the same idea. Yeah. You know, they have the same characters in a sense, but they're different visual aesthetics. And it's nice to see, like, the best of our time in 1982 and the best of our time in 2010 and being able to kind of represent a time period of what we view our future tech as. Um, the, yeah, the editing is great. Uh, Gorson actually has done a lot of comedies in, in recent years. Yeah. He did The Animal. He did I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry. So it's it's nice. He's got a great timing, and that's where this film really wins. I think the timing in this film is a little bit better than the sequel. Yes, and that it, they, I agree. The pacing knows that 95 minutes is solid enough. Yeah. It works. Yes, so. so I think sound, 
really works. The mm -hmm. music score is fantastic. Wendy Carlos, yeah. our, our Kubrick collaborator. There's a very little, there's a little bit of wonder at the end of the little, the notes a little bit. Mm -hmm. The little bit of foreboding at the beginning. It's a very complicated. It, the whole movie is pretty much in the score. Yeah. The and when you think about it, it's the same person who did The Shining. And then you think about The Shining, you're like, yeah, it is. It's like very different <laughs> movies, but you can feel that same kind of score permeating. Right, and he talked to um, animation. So Bill Coyer and Steven Lisberger were did their own production company mm -hmm. um, and did what's called Animal Olympics. I think you can find that a little bit on YouTube. And their inspiration <laughs> was uh, playing video games. Where what about was somebody actually jumped into a video game and actually actually do Frogger? Actually, mm -hmm. was Frogger in the game? That's how the concept came about. I think they did actually have arcade on set during the making of this movie, which kind of slowed down production. So Jeff Bridges got in trouble, is what I heard. <laughs> he got too into the games, but he also was apparently very good at them, and he left a number of high scores at the end of shooting. Which is kind of funny um, because in, in the movie Flynn is so good at the arcade, but then you realize he designed the arcade. Of course, he's going to be good. Yeah, <laughs> he built the system. He knows how to win the system, and maybe right. that's just the accidental method acting, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's it's funny because you look at this movie and you think. It, it's too bad it failed because we could have had something really special. Disney could have been embracing a new kind of science fiction. Yeah. Um, and even though the film got a best costume design and the best sound uh, nomination, it did lose at that, that FX. But there's so many areas where the film could have faltered. Because like you said, they shot it in kind of a black and white idea on the set. They were going to shoot this thing in the style of THX 1138, where it's going to be entirely white backgrounds. Or white on white to white. But apparently yeah. the lighting budget was outside of their ability to pay for it. They didn't okay. think they could afford it with the lighting budget, so they elected to shoot it in all darkness and then light it in computers afterwards. So again, I think the style of this film, if it had taken after THX, wouldn't have looked as neat. It wouldn't have been as, as captivating because it has a style all its own in this film. Um, a lot of um, outsourcing happening, so a lot of four other uh, computer companies worked on this film. There's even one computer company that just solely worked on the bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, People didn't know what a bit was at the time, just a binary bit. Mm -hmm. which is a, a simple program, but one company just worked on that. They had other companies just work on the designs of the ships and stuff like that. So there's a lot of outsourcing that happened to this movie that was really to me a new thing. But now it's every every movie gets outsourced to a different company's work on certain little different aspects of the things. Yeah. yeah, there's a staggering amount of the credits that's dedicated to a Taiwanese uh, uh, post-production team, and they have the, the Taiwanese characters the entire way down. And I thought that was like, I, I don't remember seeing a movie earlier than this that has that level of outsourcing where they have a like a complete like half of the credits devoted to a non-American in an American release film. Yeah. So and, and, and watch it. Oh, I like when Tron comes in face to Sark. You have very simple basic computer knowledge that everybody knows. Scanning mode. Mm -hmm. Attack mode. And then you decimate the computer program, then he gets his uh, incorporated virus, so he gets taken over, which now the program is completely dissolved, and then he goes away. Yeah, so it's all the language that kids know now that seems, I think at the time, people didn't really understand, but kids get it now. I think it's one of those movies, like we said about the thing, you, you're not going to like it, but your kids are going to. Mm -hmm. And this is a case where the movie seems, again, not a slight, the movie seems smarter than it is. It seems like it's going above your head when it's not. It's very yes. easily digestible, but it just uses a lot of terms that you're not gonna know when you're a young what person. The heck is and it's being read. sold as a as a vehicle for kids, as a vehicle for families to see. Yeah. And it maybe just that's the problem with it is that it's a movie that just was ahead of its time in the story elements, but it really wasn't that like out of this world. Like it didn't try to confuse you. It didn't play with those elements. It was only because of films like The Matrix that Tron Legacy Already felt the one need. Like that, yeah. Tron Legacy felt the need to have to like be like to like to tackle these like ethereal ethical ideas because the matrix had already happened before that though you got to have a movie that was just fun on the computer for 95 minutes yeah <laughs> and you get movies like something like the 13th floor was kind of the same kind of a premise you can jump into simulations mm -hmm. and this is the frontier of it and so a lot of times with the first one you're going to get a lot of blowback you're going to get a lot of negativity or bad responses um, I get a comedy, I get a chuckle that knowing that Steven Lisberger and Ridley Scott was hanging out at Jeff Bridges' house and they did almost did like Jaws of Scar Wounds about oh. how their movie flopped and well <laughs> this got bad, they reached each other's bad reviews and it was a therapy for them to recognize but then he goes now we come back and like how our movies get so much accolades now, well I got this, I got that so it's a little bit of reverse that Sometimes when you make something so fresh and so new that people don't really understand that maybe it needs time to marinate and get, you know, yeah. rejuvenated. And that's a different audience. Thing. Yeah, different Is generation. 
in 90, 1982, you would have movies, some movies, the really successful ones, would stay in a theater for like a year. Right. You know, that you, oh, yeah. you'd see them on the one anniversary of their release still in a theater because Ghostbusters they were still stayed moving. from 84 to the end of the 85. And we don't movie. have that now. Yeah. Right now, I mean, with especially with what's happened the last couple of years, we have movies that are making deals for 45 day windows. We already know when the Batman is going to hit HBO Max, we already know when it's hitting HBO. Um, and so. We don't have the time for these movies to marinate in the same way in the public consciousness because we have too many movies, which not a bad thing at all, yeah. but we don't have the ability to marinate them because they, they hit the theaters in less than two months, they're out on home video, and then they're, they're there. And like they can get that rediscovery, but not in the same way. So I think we may not have another case like a And Tron. I think this one, probably what's said it is rental. Yeah. I think it, nobody would care to see this in a theater. It's probably interesting to watch it But it theater. had a really great core. You know, rental being in a VHS case on a shelf, you grabbed it physically. You And the thing yeah. is, you made the promise to yourself, I'm paying two ninety nine for this. I'm going to watch I it. I invested money in this. I'm going to finish to the end. And that's, yeah. that, that's not something we get now with, with streaming, is that if this movie's on Disney+, Plus and a kid decides to click on it, and they don't know if they're invested in it after 10 minutes, it they might away. choose to go away. Yeah. So I just don't know if we're going to get many more cases like a Tron where a movie marinates, and then like 10 years later we're talking about it in the same way. I mean, we, we maybe had that with Contagion for the wrong reasons. <laughs> so I talked about uh, Harrison Ellenshaw saved this movie being on set. Jeff Bridges was on board and wholly invested it on set. But the other savior of this movie was Roger Ebert. He loved this movie. It was so in his top cool. ten. And he actually constantly battled for recognition for this movie. And actually, for us, I think for the funding of the part two, he had said to, at the University of Illinois, he had a premiere showing of this movie to college kids who'd never seen this movie, and they all loved it. In fact, he didn't show it to film study people. He showed it to people that worked in technology, oh, yeah. degrees in computer graphics, and they all loved the movie. And so another thing audience. that helped this is Roger Ebert has been, always been an advocate for this movie. Mm. Yeah, I saw uh, both him and Cisco gave it four stars, and they put it on their, their top reviewed films of the year. Um, yeah, it's, it's one that people... People who saw it enjoyed it. I think a lot of people did. It just wasn't seen enough. It wasn't circulated enough. Um, and again, even just myself, I wanted to see this movie so bad, and I couldn't find a copy of it because there was no streaming. There was no digital rentals at the time. Yeah. I had to actually go to someone's house who had a copy. Thank God I knew someone who had a copy. No one else I knew had one. So it's, again, the films are more accessible now, but in that yeah. way, they also become a little bit more forgettable. Because That's right. They, yes, they right get here. consumed. Yeah, you can see it any time you want, but it was also... Hey, Tron's gonna be on tonight. I want to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. There's. We missed the days. I still remember. I. Uh, they used to have Friday the Thirteenth marathons on TNT, and I got like six of my VHS tapes, and I Not turned the them TV to, like, show, the movie. No, the movie, the whole series, and so I would like put the VHS tape at the six-hour mode and record like four of the movies, and then I'd ride home on my bike, switch out the tapes, and record more because like that was how you got those movies, especially when you were a kid. My parents were not gonna go buy me. VHSs for Friday the 13th. That was how you had to do with this. We didn't have the Disney Channel when I was a kid either, so I couldn't record the movie. I had to hunt it down. And I think that's something that makes it a little bit more worthwhile when you finally catch something. <laughs> you don't know how many times I threw my Frisbee thinking I was trying. Yeah, was those kidding. are Frisbees, folks. So we have two 80s movies. Well, I guess I guess uh, 19. Wouldn't you put your memory disc on the front if you want to protect it instead of somebody could just come by and come by? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's any safer in the front. <laughs> in the front or you know, get damaged right. Yeah, dude. Okay. So, have you seen Tron? Yeah, let us know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Have you seen the film sequel, and which one do you prefer? Because we're actually kind of split. Uh, one of us prefers the first, one of us prefers the second. Uh, but I think we both recognize that the original Tron is a, a classic There's film. There's a little bit of reasons. juvenile to Flynn that I've probably gravitated as a kid. There's a little more play. You, you like almost... him more than Lebowski Flynn of the sequel? Yeah, <laughs> he's a little more like a kid. He's frolly. I mean, he hides behind the shelf when he hacks into the system. And, you know, you know, are we there that mommy? You know, those kind of kids that you appreciate that as a kid. You almost, it almost is a kid in the movie. You love it, our kids, fair. yeah. That's fair, yeah. Let us know what you think about the film. Uh, and, you know, are there any underrated 80s sci-fi movies that we There's haven't talked about yet? There's a bunch. Uh, there's a bunch, and you know what? We want to talk about them. So now's the opportunity for you to get your voice heard by joining that Patreon. And get I heard they're doing a documentary on sci-fi, 80s sci-fi. This has to be mentioned. Uh, so In Search of Tomorrow. I got the card over there, actually. I crowdfunded that, so we'll get that out in April. <laughs> it has to talk about this movie. I know this one is being talked about in there, um, and it's something I'm, I'm very excited to yeah. dive further into. Because actually, I will say, 80s sci-fi, I maybe don't have as much knowledge as I probably should. I remember as a kid pretending I had a lightsaber and a memory disc and playing around. Yeah, You're 
breaking you're Ready. breaking cannon. Probably had a whip on my side too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us again. If you get a chance, like and subscribe to the video. It helps yes, us out so do. very much. Um, and if you want to join that Patreon, tiers as low as a dollar, but for everything five dollars, you're not like get on our coffee. rotation. Um, you can, yeah, avoid one cup of coffee every month, and you can join people like our patrons, Brian Eggert, who can select the movies that we're picking every single month for our Patreon selections. Yeah. You can join... You hey, can congratulations, find Ebert uh, oh. Eggert, for being a Rotten Tomatoes critic now. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. We saw a lot of new Rotten Tomatoes critics uh, yeah. Yeah, there one day. Um, <laughs> congrats to you guys. Yeah. Uh, and for all of you, uh, you can find my film reviews on GoatFilmReviews.com. You can find my show, The St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere, for, anywhere you find podcasts where I interview filmmakers from the Twin Cities area. All right, I'm going to go down download some more coffee and we'll see you next time. See you later program. <laughs>